Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Greg Brayton has been a featured guest. He is a former senior computer systems designer for Martin Marietta Aerospace, a computer geologist for Philips Petroleum, and a technical operations supervisor for Cisco Systems. Greg is now considered a leading authority on bridging the wisdom of the past with the science, medicine, and peace of our future. His journeys into the remote mountain villages, monasteries, and temples of times past, coupled with his background in the hard sciences, uniquely qualify him to bring the benefit of long-lost traditions to the forefront of our lives today. From his groundbreaking book, Awakening to Zero Point, to his pioneering work in Walking Between the Worlds and the Controversy of the Isaiah Effect, Greg Brayton ventures beyond the traditional boundaries of science and spirituality, offering meaningful solutions to the challenges of our time. His most recent book, The God Code, describes the 12-year-long project and the remarkable discovery that now reveals the text message coded as the DNA within every cell of every life. What would it mean to discover an ancient language, a literal message, hidden within the DNA of life itself? What we once believed of our past is about to change, according to Greg Braden. A remarkable discovery linking the ancient biblical alphabets to modern chemistry reveals that a lost code including a text message revealing a clue to the mystery of our origins has lived within all of us all along. Following the clues discovered in 4,000-year-old texts, the language of life may now be replaced with key letters of the ancient languages translated. The message reveals that the precise letters of God's ancient name are encoded as the genetic information in every cell of every life. Greg, welcome to the program. Well, good morning, Art. It's a pleasure to hear your voice, and I'm really excited about being here this evening. That's quite a radical statement to make. Well, what makes it even more exciting, Art, this project, it is the, the result of 12 years of research. The project isn't complete. It's ongoing. And it appears that what we see is the genome, is our genetic code, actually exists as a code in many layers. And each layer has its own key to unlock the message in that layer. We are still working with the deeper keys and the deeper layers, so there is much, much more to go. What is exactly the God Code? It is the result of 12 years of research. It began when I was an engineer in the defense industry during the last years of the Cold War looking for a universal principle of peace that exists in all life. And once recognized, my hope is that that message would prevent us from finding ourselves in the kinds of wars that we found ourselves in so many times in the 20th century. The fact that we have found ourselves in so many wars, Greg, does that say the message is not clear or there are conflicting messages or what? I think it's so new. To a scientist, this is absolutely mind-boggling. There's nothing in our existing training in science that allows us to cross the traditional boundaries that have separated science from uh, ancient and spiritual traditions and, and the sciences themselves. The only way to arrive at the kinds of information we're going to discuss tonight is, in fact, to cross those traditional boundaries between chemistry, geology, biology, physics, language, to marry all of that wisdom into a, a greater knowledge that tells us more than any of them do individually. And when, when we do that, that is the way that this information is revealed. My belief has always been that we are an intentional species. Art, I think we're here on purpose. I don't claim to know who or, or what's responsible for our being here. 
the research and the more we understand about the complexities of DNA strongly suggest, as Francis Crick and so many other scientists have said as well, that there is an underlying intelligence that precedes the human race here as we know it today. All right. I understand that we have something called, the scientists called junk DNA. What is it? Well, up until last year, junk DNA was DNA that looked like it had no purpose. The way that scientists would try to explain it away is they said they were vestiges of ancient DNA that we no longer use. Like the appendix. Sure, that was the best guess. As of 2004, however, some radical discoveries in the world of genetics showed not only is junk DNA not an appendage that we're no longer using, that it is actually through what we have called junk DNA that the instructions are coded for the rest of our DNA to do what it does. So that what we've always thought was junk DNA is perhaps some of the most vital elements of the DNA. It has the instructions that tells the rest of the genetic code what to do. And somehow you found a message within the junk DNA. Well, right? it wasn't in the junk DNA. Coming from the place that I believe that we are here on purpose, I ask myself the question, if we aren't an intentional species, it makes tremendous sense to me that somewhere in our past we would have been left a clue that tells us that. And it makes very little sense that that clue would have been left on a temple wall or on a, in a single text that could crumble over time. It made tremendous sense to look within the creation of life itself for that code. I would have to agree. It does make sense. Sure. This, so, this is in the late, late 1980s. We did not know about DNA then, certainly what we know now. I was working in, uh, in a defense industry in a, an area of software development that we call pattern recognition. And the first time I saw human DNA come across, the, the sequences come across my computer screen, I looked at it and I said, wow, I, I don't know what it says, but there are definitely patterns there. This is not a random sequence. I, I wonder if we're headed toward something like the Bible code. What you're going to find is there are direct links, correlations between the way the Bible code and the Torah are encoded and the way that it appears the DNA in all life is encoded. The whole concept is intriguing, but I'm not personally certain whether it's valid or not. Are you? The jury's out on precisely why it works the way it works, all right? But what I have seen, the, the little that I have had the opportunity to work with the codes directly, in addition to reading what all the other researchers have found. And for listeners that may not be familiar with the Bible code, this is a code that is found only in the Torah, first five books of the, the Hebrew Bible and subsequently the Christian Old Testament, there is something about the way the Torah was written that makes it unique. It stands alone from any other text, and this code works only with the Torah. I interviewed Drosnin, and I must say he is very, very, very convincing. It seems way past chance probability, way, way past. Well, I think as with the, the code in our DNA, I believe the Bible code as we know it today is incomplete. I think we have only scratched the surface, and that is why the jury is still out. My sense is that as we go into the deeper message of the way the Bible code works, there will be less question as to whether or not it's an authentic code or not. And so the question, as in the Bible code, when I had Drossen on, I asked him this, and I'll ask you, right. what are the odds that this message has occurred by chance as a coincidence of some sort of odd circumstances. I'm sure you've done the math, or somebody has, sure. on what you found. Sure. Well, I ask myself that question as we begin to share what this code is saying tonight. The first time that the translation came back to me from the linguist who was helping with translate ancient languages, my next question is precisely, what are the chances? Could this be a fluke? And the chances were 0.00042% that the message that we're going to discuss tonight happened as an accident or as a fluke of, of nature which is about 1 in 256,000. To be clear, you collected this message or deciphered this message from our structured DNA, right? Precisely. Again, going back into the, my time in the aerospace industry, I, I didn't understand then what I now understand about DNA. And I began looking for this message the way I was trained as a scientist to, to look in the world around me. It led me on a journey into the, the temples and the tombs of Egypt and the monasteries and the highlands in central China, all through South America, Bolivia, Peru, the shamanic traditions all through the desert southwest and India and Nepal, looking as a scientist for the clues and all of the clues simply said, stop looking out here. You're not going to find the answer to who you are in the world around you. They all said, look within. And I began to take that clue literally. And when I did, following the instructions that were left in a 4,000-year-old Hebrew text, marrying that with the best science of our time, that's how this translation came about. 
you're educated to look for patterns. When you looked at our DNA, what did you roughly see that made you say, yikes, there is a pattern there? Repetitive sequences, precisely the same repetitive sequences coming up again and again and again, separated by vast distances of other stuff that I still don't recognize. It's all about language. If, when we talk about cells, we typically think of cells as, as these spherical capsules of the sticky, gooey, protoplasmic stuff. And each cell has 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes that are made of long strands of DNA that are made of shorter strands of genes. And right. That's the way we think about it. If we can use the following metaphor for our evening, it, it will help tremendously in visualizing how this works. If we can think of each cell as an entire library. Uh, the average human has about 50 trillion cells in the body, so 50 trillion libraries in our bodies, and each of those libraries, each of those 46 chromosomes, if we can think of those as a book, and if we can think of the long strands of DNA as chapters within the book, and the, the shorter segments of genes, if we can think of those as paragraphs and sentences, uh, that goes a long way in helping us to, to find a, the new metaphor for looking at this information in, in life, because it appears that's precisely the way this works. Well, I have a very limited understanding of genetics, but I, I guess it is the code that tells our body at different times during its life how to proceed, to grow this, grow that, begin doing this, begin doing that. I mean, it's sort of like an instruction manual and operating manual for the body, right? That's the way we think of it today. That it appears it works that way. And just as every book before Chapter 1 has a preface or a forward or an introduction, it appears that our DNA has precisely the same thing. And it took 12 years to crack the code for the introduction. The introduction is what we're going to talk about tonight. It's what this God code is all about. Deeper layers have different codes to translate them, and we're in the process of translating those now. If we were to do this program six months from now, I think we'd know a lot more then, than, certainly, than we know now. There's an author I frequently interview, and I, it's irresistible to quote him. He wrote a book about the God part of the brain, and the contention is that we all have a mortal fear of death, and so our brain as a defense mechanism has cooked up a need to worship is there any correlation to the message that you found that sounds familiar with the need to worship? To me, that would be an interpretation in my projection of my feelings on that interpretation. What is so powerful is that we don't have to believe anything. The evidence is there. There is an intelligent message encoded as the cells of life, and we can read it the way you read the text of a, of a book or a newspaper, and for that to happen the way it has happened suggest strongly that we are part of something perhaps greater than we've ever imagined. How long is the message? The introduction into the cells of all life, it is a very brief message. How much have you actually found in there? You found this. Have you found more? The introduction has been found, validated, and confirmed by the experts, and I'm comfortable sharing that. The deeper layers of the message until we can validate precisely everything that's happening, I feel responsibility to have that all confirmed and validated before, and we're still working on it. We simply don't know what all the deeper layers are saying to us. The introduction into the cells of all life, a single cell amoeba to a blade of grass to the complexity of a human, at this topmost layer reads the same, and it literally reads as the words, God eternal within the body. And when we look at a strand of DNA, the topmost layer, we're literally looking at different combinations of those words of God within the body. It doesn't say who God is or where God came from, but one of the things that's so interesting is that the name of God that's encoded into the cells is precisely the same name that we find in 2,200-year-old texts. It is a Hebrew letter form, the Hebrew word Yah, or a version of Yahweh, is, is what we find. When we first did the translation, it's done through a mathematic code. Did you find anything in there that, using the same code, didn't make sense? I have not. It's, it's interesting because the way this language is set up, uh, and we haven't even really talked about how this, how this code works. Well, let's talk about that. In other words, uh, how precisely can DNA be read as text, as words? How does it work? It's interesting, Western science today, when we define life, we do it using elements from a periodic table. We call things like hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon. And we use words 
to define those, and for each of those elements, we can also describe them with numbers. We've got all kinds of numbers, atomic weight, atomic mass, all kinds of things sure. that we can use. It appears that ancient traditions are, did precisely the same thing 5,000 years ago. They described our world through words, and they had very precise numbers linked to the letters of the alphabets and the words. What has happened is over 5,000 years, the words changed, but the numbers never changed. So this research project, when I began looking into these ancient texts and into the traditions, it was an opportunity for me to follow their beliefs and see how they correlate to Western science, which in fact they do. So all we're doing is we're looking at the way Western science describes life with words and number. Ancient traditions describe life with word and number. The words changed. The numbers didn't. We're looking for numbers of hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, the stuff that DNA is made out of. Right. And we're looking for their equivalents in the alphabets of ancient languages and what are called the core or the root alphabets, such as biblical Hebrew, uh, ancient Arabic, Sanskrit, alphabets like that. So, those of us who don't quite get all this yet, how do you read a DNA strand as words? It has something to do with numbers. I've got that. Before we even get that far, I'm just going to make a statement. A lot of our live audiences are surprised by this next statement, and I had to research it pretty extensively when I was writing the book. I have yet to find a single language that does not fall into the category that we're about to describe here. All languages, ancient and modern, have always had mystical numbers linked to every letter of every alphabet. The numbers are precise. They're mysterious. Some of them are 5,000 years old. They never change, and we're not even sure where they came from. What we're beginning to understand, though, is that those numbers do, in fact, have a basis in what today we're calling the science of chemistry. That's a big, broad statement. How do you prove it? Sure, they're a document. I have yet to see from cuneiform to Egyptian hieroglyphs to Phoenician to Hebrew and Greek and Latin, even English. And there are books that document people have spent entire lifetimes researching and documenting these mystical or hidden number equivalents for the ancient alphabets. There is a couple of books out there. One is entitled The Eastern Mysteries, another one The Western Mysteries, by a gentleman David Allen Hulse that has documented a number of these as well as others. There are other books out there. This tradition was very openly acknowledged and used prior to the advent of Western science about 400 years ago. And in the West, we began to negate those numeric values. People didn't in other cultures and other traditions. They still use them very actively today. And there are rules, very precise rules. In the second century A.D., there was a list of 32 rules that describe precisely how these numbers may be used so that they're not haphazard, so that there is a, a precision, there's a science to using the numbers in, in ancient alphabets. And that comes from what text? It is called the 32 rabbinical rules of the science that we're speaking about is called gematria, G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A, or gematria, or gematria, depending on what part of the world you're studying it from. And we've documented this in, in the book. It's on the website as well. So I'm saying this so that we know that the use of numbers and letters interchangeably is nothing new. It's been used by many traditions, much of the world, for much of our history. 400 years, we, we've stopped using it. Granted. Okay. Uh, I mean, I agree with you. Sure. Certainly that's true. It's with that in mind, when we go back and we're looking at the way ancient traditions specifically Traditions such as the Sefer Yitzhirah, which was the mystical aspect of the Hebrew Kabbalah, the way it describes the creation of our world and the universe and, and life using these letter-number combinations, and then other traditions doing the same thing. It's in looking at the links between those letters and those numbers and being able to link those numbers into the periodic table of elements as we describe them today. This message that you've deciphered again, God eternal within the body. Mm -hmm. We, of course, cannot know if that was placed there by God or by our creators who could be separate but still referencing some greater power. This is what's so important. We don't know who God is. It doesn't tell us who God is or where God came from. At the very least, what this message says to us, at the very least, it says that we're here on purpose. There's an intentionality underlying the structure of DNA in life as we know it, number one. Number two, it says that all life that shares that message has a common heritage. 
So we find bacteria on the surface of Mars or, uh, you know, in the craters of the moon, and it also reads God within the body. Oh, you've confirmed that. No, I'm saying if we do, then it suggests that we have a common heritage. And number three, because we find this message in even the simplest forms of life, in the most ancient forms, it suggests that the intelligence responsible pre-exists preceded those forms of life. It's, I, it's I'm curious, part. Greg, uh, if we get to Mars and we get a sample and we read it and it's not in there... If the code works the same and if the message reads differently, what it would suggest is that maybe we don't share that common heritage. If you were to come to this world, Art, from another world and you wanted to find out who these Earth people or what this Earth life is all about, and you'd want to disturb them to do it, if, if you could look into the introduction into the cells of all life, and you could read God eternal within the body, and you say, oh, well, that's the way our DNA reads, then it, it says that we do, in fact, share a common heritage. If we end up finding some sort of microorganism in, in another world, and it doesn't read the same, or, or the code's different, we'll have to see what that code says to know precisely. Fascinating. But again, you're telling me that this message, God eternal within the body, was sequenced one after the other. It wasn't every fourth or fifth pick but it was sequenced all together in when, convertible numbers to words. Precisely. When we speak about human DNA or the DNA of what's called carbon-based life, that is life as we typically recognize it here on right, Earth today, right. it is made of four bases, four DNA bases that are represented by those letters that we see in all the science fiction movies, C, T, A, and G. There was even a movie that came out a few years ago called Gattaca, G-A-T-T-A-C-A. -T -T -A -A. I saw it, yes. A genetic sequence of someone in our future. Those bases are literally made of the words God within the body, God eternal within the body. As we are looking at the way that DNA is sequenced, we're looking at... It's not that the message is hidden in the DNA, it's that the DNA literally is the message. We are made of these different sequences of God within the body at this uppermost level. If the pattern is that apparent that when you sat and looked at the DNA, you said, my God, there is a pa I see a pattern. Right. And then you went from there to where you are now to having deciphered this message, and it's in every cell virtually. Why has not somebody else come up with it? Paul Davies, the astrobiologist from Sydney, may have said this best. He suggested to a mainstream scientific audience in 2004 that within our DNA would be the perfect place to look for a message from a, uh, another world or something from our past, he said it would only be when our technology reached the point where we could recognize and translate the message that we could get it. Same thing they said about the Bible code. It is. However, and I agree with that to some extent, however, I think the biggest stumbling block is not the technology. It's been around for a while. It's our belief systems. And I think the answer to your question is why we didn't see this before. It's our beliefs the experts that I worked with in genetics and microbiology and linguistics, all of them said the same thing to me, Art. They said no one ever told us that we could link alphabets and biology together. So we've never done it. And I think that has been the biggest stumbling block. It's the way we have compartmentalized and separated our world into these little building blocks that we call chemistry and biology and geology so we can study them. Now we've isolated them. To the point where we don't see how they're related to one another, and that's changing. Okay, coming back to the message, God eternal within the body. Could read Buddha? Sure. What it says, the way the letters come across, first we translate the chemistry into numbers. Well, you said Yahshua. That's specific. It is. It's very precise. We translate chemistry into numbers. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, there is one number on the atomic table that links all of those together into the ancient alphabets, and that's what we call atomic mass. So if, we'll just step through this step by step. If we convert the elements of life, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, into atomic mass numbers, and then we take those numbers and we apply the ancient rules of gematria, allowing us to convert those numbers into the digits. So hydrogen becomes a 1, nitrogen becomes a 5, oxygen becomes a 6, carbon becomes a 3. We literally go to the tables of the ancient alphabets and we match those numbers with the letters in the ancient alphabets. Mm -hmm. And the only letters that they will match with are the letters that end up spelling out God within the body. So it appears to be very intentional. 
the letters could have spelled out other words. They could have spelled out something like blue sky tomorrow or something like that. It really didn't make any sense. But the fact that the letters spell words, number one, and the fact that the words put together have context and meaning adds even greater significance. It really couldn't be Buddha. From this perspective, it couldn't. When we're translating into the alphabets, the alphabets precede the tradition. So the alphabet, the Hebrew language, for example, the ancient Hebrew letters precedes the tradition. Those of our listeners who are familiar with the text of the Kabbalah, there are three key books that make up what we call the Kabbalah today. Two of them are very common, have been translated into English frequently, the Midrash and the Zohar. The third book is so mystical, many scholars say don't even bother with it. It's too mystical to even make sense. There's a question here that I was supposed to ask you, oh, sure. which is what does the message in ourselves mean to us collectively? Well, here's where I see a stumbling block. If it really says Yahshua, it may not mean anything to us collectively. Well, this is why I'm saying that the message in the alphabets precede the tradition. This says, it says that the name of God that's encoded in the cells of life is spelled as Y-A-H which is a form of YHVH, or Yahweh. In the Hebrew tradition, however, the same name, you find YH, we've done some studies with this. It's common across the Native American traditions. It's common in the, the traditions of the aboriginals. You find it running in the, the sound, Yah, as a sacred sound. In the Buddhist and the Hindu traditions, it appears to be almost a universal sound or universal name. Collectively, it tells us we're here on purpose. We have to be, number one. Number two, it says we're part of one another in all life that shares that name, even though we don't know precisely who or, or what that name means to us right now. And my sense is as we go deeper into the code, if we had this conversation six months from now, I think the rest of the code is going to tell us more about who or what God within the body really means to us. How much code remains undecoded? Well, this is what's interesting, Art, because uh, um, right now, while we don't know what the deeper layers say to us, I can tell you where the sentences begin and end. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters between the beginning and the end of the sentences. So in other words, there's plenty of message left. Well, there is. And this comes back to the correlation to the Bible code. In the earliest versions of the Torah, it's believed that the Torah that Michael Drosnin is working with, the Bible code, was received as a continuous string of letters with no punctuation, over 308,000 letters, according to Drosnin's work in the Bible Code. Was all of this sort of a natural progression from zero point? I mean, there's a commonality, mm -hmm. isn't there? For, for me, it, it is, Art, because it's all about us becoming better people and hopefully creating a better world and, and doing it within the context of, of this time in history. So the answer is yes, that's the umbrella. The well, listen, my friend, uh, quite obviously, as you decode more, we will have you back. Art, I appreciate it very much. Thanks for being such a gracious host. All right, good night. Take care. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.